Our next speaker is Dermot Malidi, who has recently given us the, completed the first full biography of John Redmond. Anyone who has read it will know what a great achievement it, it represents. So there you are, Dermot. Thank you, Patrick. Ladies and gentlemen, the fact that this centenary event should coincide with the referendum in Scotland is doubly auspicious. Not only is there uh, um, the coincidence of the dates of two events relating to the issue of self-government in two near neighbours, but there is also the light which the current event in one casts on the historical event in the other. The um, historians are in the habit of dismissing counterfactual speculation as futile. What ifs and might have beens can never be tested, uh, never mind proved. Yet here we are presented with the nearest thing to a controlled laboratory experiment that historians are, um, can expect to see. Regardless of whether the Scots vote for or against independence um, today, the very fact that they are voting, as John has said, uh, on the issue surely goes a long way to demolish the idea that Irish Home Rule was not capable of evolving in peaceful stages into full independence. We are gathered here today to mark the centenary of the signing into law of the Third Home Rule Bill by King George V. Uh, however, it, there is no consensus on the significance of the event. Some of us here believe, as I do, that it is a moment eminently worthy of celebration. Uh, however, others hold that while the event has significance historically, there is nothing to celebrate. This, this latter criticism maintains that because the Act was never intended to be implemented as it was framed to apply to the whole of Ireland, uh, it was therefore an illusion. I think there are, there are some grounds for each of these views, but neither has the full truth. I would like to, uh, to explore the, the full significance of the enactment of the Home Rule Bill by taking account of its two dimensions. Um, this isn't an attempt to force a reconciliation of two opposing viewpoints, but rather a recognition of the full historical richness, the, the dual nature of the event we are looking at. The first and positive dimension is evident when we consider it as the attainment by constitutional means of self-government by Ireland's Gaelic and Catholic national community, which had been first schooled in democracy in the early 19th century by Daniel O'Connell and later supported O'Connell's campaign for repeal of the Act of Union and then uh, the um, late 19th century campaigns for home rule under Isaac Butt and Charles Stuart Parnell. By 1914, that latter campaign for Irish self-government within the United Kingdom was 40 years old. The campaign had produced three Home Rule Bills. The first had split William Gladstone's uh, Liberal Party and uh, uh, causing it to fail. Uh, it didn't make it through the House of Commons. The second uh, Home Rule Bill, introduced also by Gladstone in 1893, won the support of a majority of British Commons MPs and passed all stages in the Commons. Uh, however, as everybody expected at the time, it fell victim to the veto of the House of Lords. When the Irish Parliamentary Party reunited in 1900 under the leadership of John Redmond with John Dillon as deputy leader, the campaign for Home Rule was reignited. In the following four general elections in 1900, 1906 and twice in 1910, the Nationalist electorate returned the Irish Party with a minimum of 71 of the 82 nationalist seats. And um, independent and dissident nationalist MPs also unanimously favored home rule. There was no dissident who was in favor of, not, of un, uh, unconstitutional forms of advancing, the national, of advancing nationalism. Um, uh, why do I mention all of this? Because it has been uh, one element of the denigration of the home rule project to suggest that it did not enjoy true democratic legitimacy among Irish nationalists. And somewhat related to this is um, the tendency to, to try to isolate Redmond himself, to suggest that, to portray him as exceptional among constitutional nationalists even. Uh, rec uh, the other night we heard on television, uh, he was described as a member of the British establishment. He had a, uh, in fact, he had a rigid personal ethos that prevented him from even socialising with members of the British political establishment. He, he kept to himself in London, and when he came back to Ireland, he spent uh, much of his time hunting on, shooting on the hills around his home in Aquavanna. Um, 
If he had been a member of the British establishment, he would have found it a lot easier to avoid making what I regard as uh, one of his monumental mistakes, which was not taking up the offer of a cabinet seat in 1915, when he was offered twice. But he, he, uh, this, this uh, rigid uh, sense of duty to um, fidelity to the uh, nationalist ethos prevented him doing that. So um, portraying him as out of touch with nationalist Ireland or as being semi-Britishized um, or, or Anglicized really is uh, um, quite wide of the reality. Now, two events changed home rule from an aspiration to a live political policy. Uh, the, the two factors, as uh, John has outlined, were the, the abolition of the, uh, the House of Lords veto and the uh, gaining of the balance of power in the January 1910 general election. These gave Redmond the, lever the leverage he needed and his own unrelenting sense of purpose did the rest, ensuring, first of all, that the Liberal government stuck to its declared intention to remove the Lord's veto, which happened in 1911, and, and second, that having done so, it placed Irish Home Rule at the top of its agenda. When Prime Minister Asquith introduced the third Home Rule Bill in April 1912, the, the rules of procedure that would govern its passage through Parliament were well known. Uh, under the terms of the Parliament Act that removed the Lord's veto, the Home Rule Bill must be passed by the Commons through three consecutive parliamentary sessions. And after the first of these sessions, it could not be further amended. So everyone knew that it would not become law until 1914. Why do I mention this? Because it has been suggested that the um, delayed passage was some kind of endless postponement intended as a dragging of feet or even as a betrayal of faith by the British government. Nobody thought that at the time. A another element in the denigration has been to focus all the attention on the Unionist campaign, and the Unionist, uh, uh, Unionist Ulster's opposition to the bill. This tends by omission to suggest that uh, there was nothing of much value or importance for nationalist Ireland in the actual content of the bill. And uh, it's all the easier to take that view by reading history backwards from now, from, from the standpoint of a sovereign independent Ireland uh, of later years, in the knowledge that the Home Rule Parliament would have been subordinate to the Westminster Parliament. Um, I would be the last to deny that Ulster's resistance was central to the, to the ultimate failure of the Home Rule project. But there was much more to the Home Rule Bill than Ulster. During the 1912 session, up to the end of the committee stage, the bill took up 52 days of parliamentary time. Compare that with 49 days for the Great Reform Bill of 1832. Only three of these days were devoted to special measures for Ulster. During the bill's committee stage, clause after clause dealing with the, the minutiae of the workings of a self-governing Ireland, from control of the police and education to the financial and fiscal powers of the new parliament, were discussed and voted on individually. There was the inevitable cut and thrust over details. Redmond lobbied hard and successfully against a government amendment which would have removed the Irish Parliament's control over the post office. But he had to give way on another amendment to remove its power to lower customs duties. The Parliament was to be allowed to raise customs duties to, by a maximum of 10%, no more. But, um, and it had uh, originally in the bill uh, been allowed to lower them. They, uh, uh, they wanted this taken out, uh, uh, British exporters to Ireland wanted this removed and the Liberals weren't for turning on it so Redmond had to give way on that amendment. But this, um, I'm just taking these examples to illustrate that the majority, the vast majority of the uh, discussion over the bill in Parliament was about the governance of Ireland, not about issues extraneous to the bill itself. Uh, altogether over three million words were spoken on the bill in 1912 alone as Redmond pointed out when the opposition claimed that it was being gagged and that the bill was being rushed through without adequate discussion. The point I'm making here is that the Act was a very substantial piece of legislation. Redmond called it a charter of liberty. For the government of Ireland's domestic affairs by a local democratically elected parliament with a responsible executive. Now this is to also recognise the, the, the limitations that it would that the Westminster Parliament would have supremacy, which uh, by on all sides was uh, recognised 
as a theoretical supremacy. They, uh, nobody expected that it would be exercised uh, with any kind of frequency. The, the, the act marked the successful culmination of a 40-year campaign supported by the overwhelming majority of Ireland's nationalists, and it formed the template for all subsequent schemes of Irish self-government. For Redmond personally, it marked success where his predecessors, O'Connell and Parnell, had failed. The reason why I also believe it is a national scandal that there is no public monument to Redmond in our capital city. So much, so much for the positive dimension. I'm very aware of the, the danger of pushing this focus too far to the point of ignoring the negative side. There is a danger of sentimentalizing the Home Rule Act. Uh, I'm not suggesting that anybody here has done it, but that uh, by suggesting that, that if only uh, it had not been, under, been overtaken by the Great War and the Easter Rebellion, that it would have brought us peacefully to a united, self-governing Ireland. So what is the negative dimension? Well, it concerns the circumstances under which the Home Rule Bill was passed and the prospects for its implementation at the moment of its enactment. After all, when it was signed into law, the extent of its territorial remit had not been settled. This fact had its origin in the refusal of the Ulster Protestants, whom, whom I regard as the second nationality or uh, national or ethnic um, community on the island, to accept home rule from Dublin and their insistence on retaining their citizenship of the United Kingdom. And that refusal was expressed, not violently at first, but first by constitutional means, by rallies and speeches, and then by the mass signing of the Ulster Solemn League and Covenant by half a million men and women in 1912. And only then, when this seemed to be ignored by the government, in the arming and training of the Ulster Volunteer Force. The cabinet only began to consider special provisions for Ulster in autumn 1913, when Asquith held talks separately and in secrecy with the protagonists, with each of the protagonists separately. There is a view, which in my opinion is overly cynical, which says that the British government knew from the beginning that the Unionist counties of Ulster would have to be excluded from the Home Rule Bill, but that they strung the Irish party along for the sake of staying in power, supported by its votes. Now, it is true that the Ulster Unionist community made clear from the start its rejection of Home Rule. It is true that Winston Churchill and David Lloyd George, supported privately by Chief Secretary Birrell in February 1912, before the Home Rule Bill was introduced, did propose the ex that Unionist Ulster should be excluded from its remit. They, they were overruled by the majority of ministers in favour of Asquith's policy of wait and see. It's also true that in the committee stage of the bill, the Commons debated an amendment to exclude four Ulster counties. The government and the Irish party voted that one down. Uh, and the government continued with wait and see. But it should be borne in mind that almost nobody in Ireland in 1912 was demanding partition. Both sides at that point were playing the game for the whole island. The nationalists for all Ireland home rule, the unionists to keep it all in the United Kingdom. Carson was quite frank at that stage in using the Ulster issue as a wrecking, as a wrecking tactic against the entire bill. The idea of partition aroused as much horror in the Irish Times, the organ of Southern Unionism, as it did among nationalists of all hues. Partition as a realistic political option emerged only gradually from the midst of gathering crisis in late 1913. On the one hand, you had Ulster volunteers drilling and marching on Ulster streets. Their leaders now seditiously threatened the setting up of, a, uh, of an Ulster provisional government. On the other side, Redmond was warning against any attempt to divide Ireland as a mutilation of the Irish nation and condemning the two-nation theory as an abomination and a blasphemy. Uh, he would soon be backed by the new force, the new military force of the Irish National Volunteers. The outcome of the behind-the-scenes consultations of autumn and winter 1913 was the first government scheme of partition put forward the following March, reluctantly supported by Redmond, to allow Ulster counties to opt out of home rule by individual plebiscite for six years, after which they would be automatically included under home rule. That scheme was rejected immediately by the Ulster Unionist MP MPs in Parliament. Instead, Carson demanded what he called the clean cut, the permanent exclusion of a block, a six-county block. 
The Union's position then was, as we know, was greatly strengthened by the preemptive mutiny by British uh, uh, officers at the Curra, and then by the importation of a large quantity of modern rifles and ammunition by the UVF. And soon, the Irish National Volunteers, who were set up after all um, to defend the Home Rule gains already won, were expanding their numbers exponentially. By the summer of 1914, the irresistible force of nationalism was on collision course with the immovable object of Unionist Ulster. An intercommunal civil war threatened. It was clear that Home Rule could be imposed on an unwilling people only at great cost in bloodshed. Now, because the Home Rule Bill could not be amended at this late stage, under the rules I mentioned earlier, the government's partition scheme had to be embodied in a separate bill, the amending bill, which they hoped to enact on the same day as the Home Rule Bill. Um, however, although the Home Rule Bill passed all, all its stages on the 25th of May, the amending bill had not been finalized by then, or uh, not even by late July, two months later. Why? Uh, due to radical disagreement on its contents. The government wanted to simply incorporate the, the uh, county plebiscite for six years option in the amending bill. Carson and the Ulster unions were demanding much more than that. The situation of deadlock was confirmed by the breakdown on the 24th of July of the Buckingham Palace Conference. Now this, this deadlock brought about a change of approach by Redmond. Just days before the Great War broke out, he was preparing to make an important new offer to Ulster Unionists. This had two key elements. First, he was going to give up the six-year time limit, allowing Ulster counties, uh, which opted out, to decide for themselves when, if ever, they would rejoin with the rest of Ireland. In the notes he prepared for this speech, he wrote that his party had been prepared from the start to make, quote, enormous sacrifices to enable Home Rule to come into being in peace, to avoid strife with our fellow countrymen. Uh, under this proposal, he said, or he would have said, that there can be no exclusion of any Ulster County. End of quote. S uh, second, he would, uh, on the other hand, he would hold out against six county block exclusion on democratic grounds. The reason being that he, he saw it as unjust to the nationalist majorities, albeit slim majorities, in counties Tyrone and Fermanagh. So he would hold his ground on individual county vote, but he would allow them to stay out as long as they wished. Uh, that was a big advance on his March position. We will never know how this fresh concession uh, might have been met, since he never got to make the speech. The speech was first scheduled for the 28th of July, it, it then got postponed because of events in Dublin to the 30th of July, but by the 30th of July, the cabinet was totally engrossed in events happening in Belgrade and the uh, gathering war clouds. The crucial point here is now is that the Home Rule Act signed into law, sorry, I, I, uh, I, should, um, I left it, sorry. we should note in passing, by the way, about Redmond, that this, this uh, speech, which he never delivered, uh, shows him as not passively reacting to events or at the mercy of British cabinet intrigues. It shows him as proactively seeking to shape events. Anyway, the crucial point is that the Home Rule Act signed into law by the King on the 18th of September uh, could not be implemented until its accompaniment, the amending bill, the deadlocked amending bill, had also been passed and signed into law. If the two bills were intended to become law on the same day, then why was the Home Rule Bill alone presented to the King for his signature on the 18th of September? It was not, as some suggest, a British exercise in hypocrisy intended to fool nationalists. Every nationalist knew that the principle of partition had been conceded. The Irish Independent was vigorously opposed to any form of partition. Uh, it had been uh, harrying and criticising Redmond and the Irish Party for months over, over even over temporary partition. It was the, by far the largest circulation daily newspaper. On the 31st of July, it wrote, the time limit has probably gone. So everybody knew that the principle had been conceded. Everybody, and nobody was being fooled that um, partition uh, was off the agenda. Rather, it was because uh, Redmond, having announced nationalist support for the war effort on the 3rd of August, he spent the next six, six weeks 
lobbying fiercely to have the Home Rule Bill signed into law as soon as Parliament would rise. The Unionists were willing to have both bills shelved for the duration of the war, and they were extremely angry and complained with some justification of sharp practice when Redmond got his way and Asquith agreed to let the Home Rule Bill receive the Royal Assent. Now, why was Redmond so insistent on this demand that that Home Rule had to take precedence and must be put on the statute book? Because he viewed the getting of the bill onto the statute book as essential to the success of his planned compromise about partition, and thus his, the chances of getting a good amending bill and therefore of a peaceful start to Home Rule. He had come very late to an acceptance of the idea of partition, and he had done nothing to educate uh, nationalist public opinion to, uh, for it. For him, it had become the, the, the hateful expedient. We mustn't underestimate the shock of the impact of the idea on nationalists. As Conor Cruz O'Brien wrote in his memoir, it was not so much the loss of the counties themselves, but the unexpected flaw that had suddenly revealed itself in the whole Home Rule project, and at the very moment of its seeming triumph. Redmond knew that his planned concession of, of partition without time limit, when the amending bill would come up again at the end of the war, would place him in an extremely delicate position with his own nationalist electorate. He judged that, that such a momentous concession, to have any chance of concession by his followers, could be made only at the moment of nationalist victory, in a spirit of magnanimity and for the sake of peace. In the notes for the undelivered speech, he wrote, I believe that no settlement is possible until the Home Rule Bill is actually on the statute book. After that, men will realize the true situation and both sides will find it easier to agree. It was a gamble. It was a gamble with his own leadership of the Irish party and of the nation. So what were the consequences of placing the Home Rule Bill on the statute book? When told that the signing was imminent, Redmond issued a manifesto to the Irish people which declared, the democracy of Great Britain listened to our appeal and have kept faith with Ireland. It is now a duty of honour for Ireland to keep faith with them. Ireland would be false to her history and to every consideration of honour, good faith and self-interest did she not willingly bear her share in its burdens and its sacrifices. That was the prologue to his speech at Woodenbridge a few days later, which came two days after the signing of the Act, in which he went beyond his stance of the 3rd of August and called on nationalist men to enlist in the army and to go, as he said, wherever the firing line extends in defense of right, of freedom, and of religion in this war. That, that manifesto and that act, that speech in, at Woodenbridge would in turn lead to the secession of the 7% minority of Irish volunteers with, with fateful consequences. The manifesto ended with the hope, as Irish soldiers were going to fight and die at each, at each other's side, quote, that their union in the field may lead to a union in their home, and that their blood may be the seal that will bring all Ireland together in one nation. The onset of war had rescued him from one threat, the threat of a split in his party. He now took refuge in a new hope, that a new common Irish identity might be forged at the front making partition unnecessary in the long run. It was, I admit, wishful thinking of a high order. But if Redmond was guilty of self-delusion, so were many others. What could be more fatuous than Owen McNeill's talk of joining hands with the, Irish par with the Orange Party, or Pierce's musing that, I am glad that the Orange men have armed, for it is a good thing to see arms in Irish hands. I should like to see any and every body of Irish citizens armed. So uh, there was a lot of self-delusion around at the time. The 1916 rebellion, uh, among many other things, generated an atmosphere which made it much more difficult to get to achieve the kind of amicable beginning to partition for which Redmond had come to hope. And let us, uh, let us rid ourselves of the idea that it was a rebellion caused by frustration at the uh, delayed implementation of home rule. It wasn't. Uh, it was a rebellion against home rule led by people who despised the very idea of, of home rule. 
After the failed attempt in summer 1916 to implement home rule immediately with, with six county partition, Redmond and his party were terminally damaged by the anti-partition backlash stoked by the Catholic bishops and by the Irish Independent. They were driven back to the position of rejecting any form of home rule that did not embrace all of Ireland. We should make, we should make no mistake about what that view means. As the Redmondite MP Stephen Gwynne put it in 1918 to a fellow Home Rule MP, we have repeatedly been offered Home Rule on the spot on terms of leaving out the six counties. But freedom in Ireland has come to mean freedom to, to coerce Ulster. This takes us to the nub of the case made against the Home Rule achievement, that it was, uh, uh, firstly that it was never put into effect and that the freedom of small nations for which Irishmen had enlisted to fight was denied to their own country. But the reality was that Home Rule was there for the taking at any point in 1917 or 1918, and uh, uh, possibly in Dominion form in 1919, if only nationalists would drop the demand that the British government should also force it on, the un on an unwilling Unionist Ulster. For over s seven sterile decades, nationalist Ireland clung to the myth that partition was a was a conspiracy from without, rather than a problem to be addressed within. For three of these decades, a self-mandated army drew inspiration from that myth in its futile attempt to end partition by coercing Ulster. Uh, happily, that view carries less weight now when the people of independent Ireland have formally embraced the principle of consent, removing the constitutional clause claiming jurisdiction over Northern Ireland without abandoning their aspiration to all Ireland uh, unity. So to, um, to conclude, I think we should commemorate the signing of the Home Rule Act in its full complexity. We should celebrate it as what John Bruton has called a parliamentary, a great parliamentary achievement by Ireland's nationalist community. We should celebrate it as what Paul Bew recently called a great democratic moment in the intertwined uh, histories of the British and Irish peoples a moment when there was a deepening of the understanding between the two peoples. But we should also learn a sober lesson from its fate, as a warning against making territory more important than the people who live on it, and a warning against turning the ideal into the enemy of the good. Thank you. Right, uh Thank you very much, Dermot Malady. We will now have a 15-minute coffee break. Could you aim to be back here at half 11 or as soon as possible thereafter so that there can be time for discussion after the other two speakers? And, mm -hmm. and I'm sure you all agree in thanking our two speakers for very interesting papers. Mm -hmm.